This is Tom Fox. I'd like to introduce an audio white paper on hallmark number two of 10 hallmarks of an effective compliance program. Written standards consisting of a code of conduct, compliance policies and procedures, and internal controls. A, code of conduct. What is the value of having a code of conduct? I have heard many business folks ask that question over the years. In its early days, a code of conduct tended to be lawyer-written and lawyer-driven to wave in a regulator's face during an enforcement action by using it to claim, we are an ethical company. Is such a legalistic code effective in this day and age? Is a code of conduct more than simply your company's internal law? What should be the goal in the creation of your company's code of conduct? In the 2012 FCPA guidance, the Department of Justice and Securities and Exchange Commission stated, a company's code of conduct is often the foundation upon which an effective compliance program is built. As the DOJ has repeatedly noted, the most effective codes are clear, concise, and accessible to all employees and to those conducting business on a company's behalf. Indeed, it would be difficult to implement a compliance program if it was not available in the local language so that employees in foreign subsidiaries can access and understand it. When assessing a compliance program, the DOJ and SEC will review whether the company has taken steps to make certain the code of conduct remains current, effective, and whether a company has periodically reviewed and updated its code of conduct. In the Society for Corporate Compliance and Ethics 2017 Complete Compliance Ethics and Ethics Manual, in an article entitled Essential Elements of an Effective Compliance and Ethics Program, authors Debbie Troklas, Greg Warner, and Emma Schwartz stated that your company's code of conduct should, first and foremost, the standards of conduct demonstrate the organization's overarching ethical attitude and its system-wide emphasis on compliance and ethics with applicable laws. They go on to state, the code is meant for all employees and all representatives of the organization, not just those who who are most actively involved in known compliance and ethics issues. This includes management, vendors, suppliers, independent contractors, which are frequently overlooked groups. From the board of directors to volunteers, the companies believe that everyone must read, receive, understand, and agree to abide by the standards of the Code of Conduct. There are several purposes which should be communicated in your Code of Conduct. The overriding goal is for all employees to follow what is required of them under the Code of Conduct. You can do this by communicating those requirements to providing a proper a process for proper decision-making, and then requiring that all such persons subject to the Code of Conduct put these standards into everyday business practice. Such actions are some of your best evidence that a company upholds and supports proper compliance conduct. The substance of your Code of Conduct should be tailored to your company's culture and to its industry and corporate identity. It should provide a mechanism by which employees are trying to do the right thing in the compliance business and ethics arena can do so. The code of conduct can be used as a basis for employee review and evaluation. It certainly can be invoked if there is a violation. Your company's disciplinary procedures should be stated in the code of conduct. These would include all forms of discipline up to and including dismissal for serious violations of the code of conduct. Further, your company's code of conduct should emphasize it will comply with all applicable laws and regulation wherever it does business. The code needs to be written in plain English and translated into other languages as necessary so that all applicable persons can understand it. As I often say, the three most important things about your compliance program is document, document, document. The same is true in communicating your company's code of conduct. You need to do more than simply put it on your website and tell folks it is there, available, and they should read it. You need to document that all employees or anyone else that has your code of con- that your code of conduct is applicable to has received read and understands it the department of justice expects each company to begin its compliance program with a very public announcement very robust code of conduct if your company does not have one you need to implement one immediately if your company has not re- 
reviewed or assessed your code of conduct for five years, I suggest that you do so in short order, as much has changed in the compliance world. How important is the code of conduct? Consider the 2016 SEC enforcement action involving United Airlines, which turned on the violation of its company's code of conduct. The breach of the code of conduct was determined to be an FCPA internal controls violation. It involved a clear quid pro quo benefit paid out by United Airlines to David Sampson, the former chairman of the Board of Directors of the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey, the public government entity which has authority over, among other things, United Airlines operations at the company's huge East Coast hub in New Jersey. The actions of the former United CEO Jeff Smizek, in personally approving the benefit granted to favor Samson, violated the company's internal controls around gifts to government officials by failing to not only follow the United Code of Conduct, but by also violating it. The $2.4 million civil penalty leveled on United was in addition to the non-prosecution agreement settled with the Department of Justice, which resulted in a penalty of $2.25 million. The scandal also caused the resignation of Smizek and two high-level executives. B. Policies and procedures. There are numerous reasons to put some serious work into your compliance policies and procedures. They are certainly a first line of defense when the government comes knocking. The FCPA guidance made clear that whether a company has policies and procedures the out, that outline the responsibilities for compliance within the company, detail proper internal controls, auditing practices, documentation policies, and sets forth disciplinary procedures will also be considered by the Department of Justice and SEC. By using the word considered, it is clear this means that regulators will take a strong view against a company that does not have a well-thought-out and articulated set of policies and procedures, all of which are systematically reviewed and updated. Moreover, having policies written out and signed by employees provide what some consider the most vital layer of communication and even act as an internal control. Together with a signed acknowledgement, these documents can serve as evidentiary support if future issues arise. In other words, the document, document, document mantra applies just as strongly to this area of anti-corruption compliance. The specific written policies and procedures required for a best practices compliance program are well known and long established. The FCPA guidance stated, among the risks that a company may need to address include the nature and extent of transactions with foreign governments, including payments to foreign officials, use of third parties, gifts, travel, and entertainment expenses, and charitable and political donations and facilitating and expediting payments. Policies help form the basis of expectation for conduct in your company. Procedures are the documents that implement these standards of conduct. The role of compliance policies is to protect the companies, their stakeholders, including employees, third parties, and others, despite an occasional lapse. A company's compliance policies provide a basic set of guidelines for employees and others to follow. Compliance policies should give general prescriptions and should be supplemented by more specific procedures. By establishing what is and what is not acceptable ethical and compliant behavior, a company helps mitigate the risks posed by employees who might not always make the right ethical decisions. The evaluation of corporate compliance programs builds upon the requirements articulated in the 2012 FCPA guidance. Under prong four, policies and procedures, there are two parts, design and accessibility and operational integration. Part A, design and accessibility, has the following components. Designing and designing compliance policies and procedures has the following questions. What has been the company's process for designing and implementing new policies and procedures? Who has been involved in the design of the policies and procedures? Have business units slash divisions been consulted prior to rolling them out? Under the heading applicable policies and procedures are the following questions. Has the company had policies and procedures that prohibited the misconduct? How has the company assessed whether these policies and procedures have been effectively implemented? How have the functions that had ownership of these policies and procedures been held accountable for supervisory oversight. The evaluation goes on to ask about both the accessibility and effectiveness of compliance programs by stating under accessibility. 
How has the company communicated the policies and procedures relevant to the misconduct to relevant employees and third parties? How has the company evaluated the usefulness of these policies and procedures? Compliance policies do not guarantee employees will always make the right decision. However, effective implementation and enforcement of compliance policies demonstrate to the government that a company is operating professionally and ethically for the benefit of its stakeholders and its employees and the communities it serves. There are five general elements to a compliance policy. It should stake out the following. Identify who the compliance policy applies to. Two, set out what the objective of is of the compliance policy. Three, describe why the compliance policy is required. Four, outline a- examples of both acceptable and un- unacceptable behavior under the compliance policy. And five, lay out the specific consequences for failure to comply with the compliance policy. The evaluation mandates that there must be communication of your compliance policies and procedures throughout your workforce, relevant stakeholders, such as third parties and business venture partners. Under B of prong four is the operational integration section with the following components. Under the topic responsibility for integration are the following questions. Who has been responsible for integrating policies and procedures? With whom have they consulted, e.g. officers, business segments? How have they been rolled out, e.g. do compliance personnel assess employees, whether employees understand the policies? There are also two specific areas that policies and procedures need to focus on around payments and third parties. These have the following components laid out in the evaluation. Under the topic payment systems are the following questions. How how was the misconduct in question funded, i.e. purchase orders, employee reimbursements, discounts, petty cash? What processes could have prevented or detected improper access to these funds? How have these processes been improved? Under the topic vendor management, it asks the questions, if vendors have been involved in the misconduct, what was the process for vendor selection and did the vendor go through that process? This means that it's simply more than having appropriate policies and procedures. It is operationalizing them into your compliance program down to the business unit level. How can you do so? Compliance training is only one type of communication. This is a key element for compliance practitioners because if you have a 30,000 plus employee workforce worldwide, simply the logistics of training can appear daunting. Small groups where detailed questions about policies can be raised and discussed can be a powerful teaching tool. Another technique can be posting frequently asked questions in common areas and virtually. Also, having a written compliance policies signed by employees provide what some consider the most vital layer of communication. A signed acknowledgement can serve as evidentiary support if a future issue arises. Finally, never forget the example of the Morgan Stanley Declination, where the recalcitrant employee annually signs such certifications. These signed certifications help Morgan Stanley walk away with a full declination. The 2012 FCPA guidance ends its section on policies with the following. Regardless of the specific policies and procedures, the standards should apply to personnel at all levels of the company. It is important that company policies and procedures are applied fairly and consistently throughout the organization. The fair process doctrine demonstrates that if a compliance policies and procedures are not applied consistently, there is a greater chance that an employee dismissed for breaching a promise a policy could successfully claim he or she was unfairly terminated. This last point cannot be overemphasized. If an employee is going to be terminated for fudging their expense accounts in Brazil, you would best make sure that the same conduct lands the top producer in the United States with the same quality of discipline. Internal Controls and Compliance The Department of Justice and SEC in the 2012 FCPA guidance stated, Internal controls over financial reporting are the processes used by companies to provide reasonable assurances regarding the reliability of financial reporting and the preparation of financial statements. These include various components, such as a control environment that covers the tone set by the organization regarding integrity and ethics, risk assessments, control activities that cover personnel, rather policies and procedures designed to ensure that management directives are carried out, e.g. approvals, authorizations, reconciliations, and segregation of duties, 
information and communications and monitoring. Moreover, the design of companies' internal controls must take into account the operational realities and risks attendant to the company's business, such as the nature of its products, how the products or services get to the market, the nature of the workforce, and the degree of regulation, the extent of government interaction, and the degree it has operations in countries with a high risk of corruption. All of this was supplemented in the evaluation of corporate compliance programs with the following questions under controls. What controls failed or were absent that would have detected or prevented the misconduct? Are they present now? Aaron Murphy, Assistant Solicitor General in the Office of the Attorney General for the State of Utah and author of Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, a practical resource for managers and executives, said, Internal controls are policies, procedures, monitoring, and training that are designed to ensure company assets are properly used with proper approval and the transactions are properly recorded in the books and records. While it's theoretically possible to have good controls but bad books and records and vice versa, the two generally go hand in hand. Where there are record-keeping violations and internal controls failure is almost always presumed because the records would have been accurate had the controls been adequate. Internal controls expert Joel Howell, executive vice president of Workiva Inc., has said that internal controls are systemic measures such as reviews, checks, balances, methods, and procedures instituted by an organization that performs several different functions. These functions include allowing a company to detect its business in an orderly and efficient manner, to safeguard its assets and resources, to detect and deter errors, fraud, and theft. To assist an organization in ensuring the accuracy and completeness of that accounting data, data, to enable a business to produce reliable and timely financial and management information, to help an entity ensure that there's adherence to its policies and plans by its employees, applicable third parties, and others. Hal adds that internal controls are entity-wide, that is, they are not limited to the accountants and auditors. Hal also notes that for compliance purposes, Controls are those measures specifically to provide reasonable assurance that any assets and resources of a company cannot be used to pay a bribe. This definition includes the diversion of company assets, such as by unauthorized sales discounts or receivable write-offs as the distribution of assets. Why are internal controls important in your compliance program? There are several FCPA enforcement actions that demonstrate the reasons. The first was a criminal plea obtained by the Department of Justice from Weatherford International. There were three areas where the company failed to institute appropriate internal controls. First, around, the, around third parties and business transactions, limits of authority and documentation requirements. Second, on affecting, effectively evaluating business transactions, including acquisitions and joint ventures for corruption risks and to determine those risks when detected. Finally, around excessive gifts, travel, and entertainment, where such expenses were not adequately vetted to ensure that they were reasonable, bona fide, and properly documented. The second case involved the gun manufacturer Smith & Wesson. This case was a civil matter prosecuted administratively by the SEC. In its administrative order, the SEC stated, Smith & Wesson failed to devise and maintain sufficient internal controls with respect to its international sales operation. While the company had a basic corporate policy prohibiting the payment of bribes, it failed to implement a reasonable system of controls to effectuate that policy. Moreover, the company did not devise and maintain a system of multiple accounting controls sufficient to provide reasonable assurances that the transactions are executed in accordance with management's general or specific authorizations. Transactions are recorded as necessary to maintain accountability for assets and that asset to access to assets is permitted only in accordance with management's general or specific oper- authorization. The third example is circumvention of existing internal controls with no justification or appropriate compliance function oversight. It comes from the SEC enforcement action against Halliburton for hiring an Angolan agent by moving him from the commercial agent status to that of a supplier so the approval process would be easier. However, the internal control process around using a supplier also had rigor as it required a competitive bidding process, which would take several months to complete. 
Overriding this internal control, the local business team was able to contract with the Angolan agent for these services, all without the Angolan agent going through the normal procurement internal controls. A second internal control which was overridden was the procurement requirement that the supplier procurement process begin with an assessment of the critically or risk of a material or services, not with a particular supplier and certainly not without competitive bids or providing a single source justification. There was a separate internal control that reviewed contracts over $10,000 with a high risk of corruption such as Angola to be reviewed and approved by the Tender Review Committee. This internal control was also overridden. Halliburton internal controls required that when a single source was used by a company, it had to have a business justification. This justification would require the showing of preference for quality, technical execution, or other reasons, none of which were demonstrated by the Angolan agent. Finally, if such a single source was used, the reasons had to be documented or in Halliburton's internal control language identified and justified. None were documented by the company. Finally, as the internal controls were either circumvented or overridden, as a consequence, internal, con- internal audit was kept in the dark about the transaction until late 2010, its late 2010 yearly review, and did not examine them. This was yet another internal control failure, but was built upon previous failures noted above. The whole concept of internal controls is that a company needs to focus on where the risks are, what the, whether they be compliance risks or others, and the need to allocate limited resources to putting the controls in place that address those risks. In the compliance world, of course, your two biggest risks are assets or resources of a company. Not just cash, but inventory, fixed assets being used to pay a bribe. And then the second big element would be the diversion of those company assets, such as unauthorized sales discounts or receivables and write-offs, which are used to pay a bribe. There are four significant internal controls that I would suggest a compliance practitioner implement initially. There are number one, delegation of authority. Number two, maintenance of the vendor master list. Number three, contracts with third parties. And number four, movement of cash slash currency. Your delegation of authority should reflect impact of compliance risk, including both transactions and geographic location, so that a higher level of approval for matters involving third party for funds transfer and invoice payments to countries outside the U.S. would be required inside your company. Next is the vendor master list, which can be one of the most powerful powerful preventive control tools, largely because payments to factitious vendors are one of the most common occupational frauds. The vendor master file should be structured so that each vendor can be identified not only by risk level, but also by the date on which the vetting was completed and the vendor received final approval. There should be an electronics control put in place to block payments for any vendor for which the vetting has not been approved. Internal controls are needed over the submission, approval, and input of changes to the vendor master file. Contracts with third parties can also be an effective internal control, which works to prevent nefarious conduct rather than simply as a tech control. I would caution that for contracts to provide effective internal controls, relevant terms of those contracts, including the instance, <clears throat> for instance, the commission rate, reimbursement of business expenses, and use of subagents should be available to those who process and approve vendor invoices. All situations involving the movement of cash or transfer of monies outside the U.S., including such message, such account payable computer checks, manual checks, wire transfers, replenishment of petty cash loans and advances should all be reviewed from the compliance risk standpoint. This means you need to identify the ways in which a country manager or sales manager could cause funds to be transferred to their control and to conceal the true nature of the use of the funds within the accounting system. To prevent these types of activities, internal controls need to be in place. All wire transfers outside the U.S. should be defined, should have defined approvals in the delegation of authority. Persons who execute the wire transfers should be required to evidence agreement of the approvals of the delegation of authority and wire transfer requests going outside of the United States should always require dual approvals. Lastly, wire transfer requests going outside the United States should be required to include a description of proper business purpose. The bottom line is that internal controls are just good financial controls. The internal controls 
that detail for, for third-party representatives in the compliance context will help to detect fraud, which could lead to bribery and corruption. As an exercise, I suggest that you map your existing internal controls to the 10 hallmarks of an effective compliance program or some other well-known anti-corruption regime to see where control gaps may exist in your organization. This will help you to determine whether the internal compliance controls are functioning or present in your company. From there, you can work to determine if they are functioning. This is Tom Fox. I hope you've enjoyed this audio white paper on hallmark number two of 10 hallmarks of an effective compliance program. I hope you will listen in for additional audio white papers on the 10 hallmarks of an effective compliance program. This is Tom Fox again. Thank you again for listening to hallmark number two of the 10 hallmarks of an effective compliance program audio white paper series that I'm running. This audio white paper is based upon the upcoming book, the Complete Compliance Handbook, which will be published by Compliance Week in April. It is available for pre-sale now and review at my website, www.fcpacompliancereport.com. I hope you will check out the book, order a copy, uh, which will be delivered after it goes on sale. This is Tom Fox. Thanks again for listening.